the mysterious West Mountain Base has finally emerged, and it seems they've caught wind of my extensive material collection. Consequently, I've become a target for this powerful underground force. After dealing with Lu Funga, who predictably laid a trap, he sent out a mass text message to everyone in Heavenly Sea City. Luckily, my smoke bomb diverted attention away from his message, leaving no trace behind. But Lu Funga's message only hinted at my identity, address, and the possibility of possessing stolen goods from the Walmart warehouse in large quantities. Yet large quantities lacks a precise measurement, leaving room for interpretation. After all, how could he know about my spatial abilities? I've sent out hundreds of decoy messages, making it difficult for ordinary folks to distinguish fact from fiction. If someone does manage to track me down, they won't be just any ordinary group, they could be skilled computer experts or worse. If you've missed any previous chapters, the link is in the description below. Be sure to catch up. Alright folks, let's set our sights high today. Our goal is 500 likes. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. After weeks of non-stop training with my bow and arrow, I've noticed some changes. It's like my spatial awareness has expanded, giving me these cool powers. Now, I can attach this ability to my weapons and projectiles, making them hit harder and more accurately. I can even nail a target 400 meters away with just one arrow. Then it hit me. What if I use this ability for close combat or even on myself? Turns out, it works like a charm. With this ability wrapped around me, I feel like I'm gliding through the air, way faster than before. Dodging attacks is a breeze now too. I'm starting to really dig these powers of mine. They might seem simple, but I can tell they've got tons of potential for growth. It's like I'm just scratching the surface of what I can do. But then, my stomach decides to join the conversation with a loud growl. I quickly scarf down a couple of chocolate bars, realizing that all this power doesn't come for free. It takes fuel. So, I guess mutants like me are only as strong as the snacks we have on hand. Without food, even the mightiest abilities are useless. But hey, I've got my own little stash of supplies tucked away in my secret space. With unlimited snacks at my disposal, I can outlast anyone. Who needs to be invincible when you've got endless chocolate bars? Meanwhile, in an underground shelter, Chin Xin Yan, the leader of the West Mountain Organization, frets over the energy issues of the base. Just then, Secretary Guo enters with a stack of papers, announcing that they've investigated the messages received earlier. Most of them originate from Villa 101 in Lark Manor, with one special message from Lu Funga, chairman of the Intelligent Cloud Group, residing in Villa 302. Chen Xin Yan reviews the report, pondering over the details. He requests a comprehensive analysis of the individual mentioned in the report, curious about what a mere warehouse manager could incite. As Secretary Guo meticulously recounts Zhang Yi's information, Chen Xin Yan's interest wanes upon learning of his modest position. Just a penny thief he dismisses, speculating that Zhang Yi likely embezzled goods due to his role, but his involvement in the warehouse theft seems trivial. Secretary Guo, eager to please, agrees with the leader's assessment, flattering his keen judgment. Qin Xin Yan sees through the situation, attributing it to a foreign conspiracy, suggesting that the perpetrators received intelligence beforehand and orchestrated the drama to cover their tracks. Impressed by the leader's insight, Secretary Guo continues to praise his astuteness, acknowledging that such petty schemes could never fool him. Guo glanced at Zhang Yi Dot and Qin Xin Yan exchanged a thoughtful glance. We haven't checked out the Herons River District area yet, Xin Yan suggested. Let's send a few people over to investigate. Who knows, we might stumble upon some clues about that batch of material. After losing a battle against Zhang Yi, doubts about Chumli's abilities spread among the villagers. Feeling deeply affected, Chumli questioned his role as the chosen one in the script, believing he possessed top-tier skills meant to lead him to a life of greatness. However, the reality of his vulnerability hit him hard. Sinking into despair, Chumley found solace in indulging himself multiple times a day and lamenting about the world while glued to his phone. One day, while browsing his phone out of boredom, Chumley noticed something odd about the sudden flood of fake messages he had received days earlier. Sensing a connection to the mysterious person who had frightened him before, Chumley, an otaku with some computer skills, quickly detected something fishy in the message's IP information. The source caught his attention, Zhang Yi, warehouse manager at Walmart South Warehouse. This revelation stirred Chumley's curiosity. Could Zhang Yi be responsible for the theft case at Walmart, which had been big news just before the apocalypse? Chumley's imagination ran wild. He speculated that Zhang Yi might possess a spatial domain ability, like a vacuum cleaner with infinite capacity, capable of storing a large number of objects. Recalling the incident where Zhang Yi's control over ice and snow seemed to make them vanish and reappear, Chumley had an epiphany. He must be a spatial mutant himself. The stolen goods from the Walmart warehouse might be in Zhang Yi's alternate space. Feeling a mix of awe and envy, Chumli realized the potential of Zhang Yi's abilities compared to his own. Could Zhang Yi be the real protagonist of this story? 
Chumley couldn't shake the feeling of being overshadowed by Zhang Yi's impressive abilities. His own ice and snow powers felt inadequate in comparison, especially since Zhang Yi seemed to effortlessly counter them. It was clear to Chumley that he was destined to be nothing more than a sidekick to Zhang Yi. Realizing the vast gap in strength between himself and Zhang Yi, Chumley had an epiphany. If he couldn't beat him, why not join him? That way, he could still play a role, albeit a secondary one. With this decision in mind, Chumley leaped out of bed, determined to warn the villagers about the danger posed by Zhang Yi. Breathless from his jog, Chumley urgently sought out village chief Su Dongshu. Despite being dismissed as a waste before, Chumley now commanded respect due to his newfound ice and snow abilities. He wasted no time in sharing his concerns with the chief. We're no match for Zhang Yi, Chumley warned. Lar Manor is too close, and it's best for the villagers to steer clear. Fishing in that area is also risky. However, Chief Su Dongshu seemed more intrigued by another piece of information. Are you saying Zhang Yi was behind the Walmart warehouse incident before the apocalypse? He asked, his eyes glinting with wisdom. Chumli nodded vigorously. It's highly likely. He might have a spatial ability, allowing him to stash away billions worth of goods. The chief's eyes sparkled with excitement. If we could seize those goods, our town would never have to worry about food again, he mused to himself. Chumli was taken aback. We really shouldn't be eyeing his goods, he whispered nervously. But Sue didn't seem impressed. You're too cowardly, she scoffed. Our village has thousands of people. Are we really afraid of one young boy? Chumli was speechless for a moment. The chief chimed in, his tone thoughtful. You're a coward, afraid of death. When I was young, fighting with neighboring villages over water and land, didn't we always end up bloodied? Now, in these dire times for our Sioux family town, even if it costs a few lives, so what? Frustration boiled inside Chumli. His good intentions had backfired. Meanwhile, in a lavish manner, Zhang Yi was savoring the taste of a newly opened 1982 Lafitte with two sisters. Despite the dangers lurking outside, life in this villa felt like paradise. Even Zhang Yi, who had always dreamed of leaving after the apocalypse, found himself gradually immersed in this bliss, unable to tear himself away. Just then, a scream shattered the tranquility outside, jolting me to my feet. I immediately sensed something was amiss and rushed to the balcony on the second floor. With my infrared binoculars in hand, I scanned the surroundings of the villa. A large group of shadows was converging on us, unmistakably villagers from the Sioux clan across the river. Given the recent incident just two days ago, only rash people would rush over without investigating. I retrieved a sniper rifle from my alternate space, prepared to oblige their eagerness for trouble. Though they came in numbers with ill intent, these ordinary folks weren't much of a threat. My only concern was their mutant villager. If he showed up, I'd seize the opportunity to eliminate him too. As I searched the crowd for the mutant, I let the rest encounter the power of my traps. Meanwhile, the Sioux family town's advance team reached the edge of the traps, gazing at the brightly lit villa not far away. It felt like a dream for them. After surviving the frozen apocalypse on stored food and fishing, they couldn't fathom someone living such a lavish life just across the river in the affluent area. Lost in thought, one villager stepped forward, only to let out a scream as intense pain shot up from his foot. The group quickly rushed to his aid, discovering he had stepped on a board with sharp nails, piercing through his foot. In such freezing temperatures, such a wound could be fatal. The team leader urgently ordered him to be carried away, warning the others to beware of traps. The village chief leading from behind, heard the news and immediately gave orders. It seemed the other party had planned ahead, but Sudin wasn't phased. He instructed us to use branches and sticks to cautiously probe ahead. Watching from a distance, I was amused by their cleverness. The real show was just beginning. Indeed, they managed to clear quite a few nail traps, slowly closing in on us. As the village chief cleverly countered the first wave of traps, the villagers grew encouraged, gradually letting their guard down. Just then, someone felt a resistance near their foot, as if they had tripped over a rope. The next second, a fireball shot into the sky, followed by a huge explosion echoing through the heavens, blowing a dozen people away. Fear gripped the villagers as they retreated, but some were not spared from the intense pain of flying shrapnel. Injured and panicked, they fell to the ground, screaming in agony. The chaos escalated as another loud bang startled everyone, someone had triggered a grenade trap. Frantically scrambling back, the villagers encountered more nail traps hidden in the snowy ground. In the darkness, they lost their sense of direction, adding to the confusion. The scene turned into a bloody spectacle, with continuous explosions and casualties. Some villagers began to retreat, feeling embarrassed by their lack of preparation. It was a harsh awakening to the seriousness of the situation. They realized they needed Chumley's help. With his ability to manipulate ice and snow, he was like a human cheat code in these icy conditions. The villagers quickly surrounded the village chief, urging him to call for Chumley's assistance. Sudan's expression turned grim as he considered the potential for more casualties. Earlier, Chumley had warned him not to provoke Zhang Yi, 
a warning Sudan had dismissed as cowardice. But now, faced with the aftermath of the first wave of attacks, the villagers were bewildered. Meanwhile, quietly observed with a sniper rifle in hand, waiting for the ice and snow mutant to make a move. With so many people around, it was hard to distinguish the mutant from the villagers. Knew he could snipe them from less than 200 meters away. Even if the mutant attacked from behind, as long as he was within 2,000 meters, could still take him down. Caught between a rock and a hard plate, he couldn't ask Chumley for help after boasting about taking down Zhang Yi alone. Besides, seeking assistance from a grandson was unthinkable. Stealing his resolve, Su Ongxing loudly questioned their reliance on Chumley's traps, dismissing them as mere child's play. Despite the temptation of the luxuriously furnished house ahead, complete with delicious food and beautiful women, the villagers remained cautious, wary of the traps hidden beneath the snowy ground. While Chumley's abilities could easily uncover the traps, the villagers wanted to call upon him, still uncertain of their next move. Upon hearing the call to summon Chumley, the village chief erupted in fury. You useless lot, he bellowed. Seems our village, except for Chan La, is filled with cowards. If you're scared, then go back home now. Don't embarrass yourselves here. Surprisingly, this reverse psychology worked wonders. The villagers' blood boiled, and they vehemently declared they were not cowards. They picked up their tools and bravely continued clearing the traps. Observing this, Su Dong Shu nodded in satisfaction. That's more like it, he thought. These child's play traps are nothing to be afraid of. With a bit of caution, they're harmless. Encouraged by the village chief's provocation, the villagers grew smarter, learning from their initial painful lessons. They began throwing snow blocks ahead from a distance, triggering several traps and boosting their confidence. Just 100 meters more, and all the food and beauties inside will be ours, Su Dong Shu remarked with a smug smile. Shotgun team, keep up, he commanded. They must have noticed us, he said. They have guns. If they dare to shoot, we'll return fire immediately. The chief's cousin, a retired soldier, eagerly volunteered. If that guy shows his face, I'll blow his head off, he vowed. Watching all this through the scope, couldn't help but think that they weren't too stupid. This method of clearing traps hadn't crossed his mind, but the real challenge was yet to come. Primitive methods could only clear primitive traps, the upcoming high-tech ones would truly test their skills. Yang Mi, having just finished her meal, panicked at the sight of the crowd outside. There are so many people. If they break in, we're done for, she exclaimed. On the other hand, Dr. Zhu remained calm. I wonder how many will die this time, she remarked, not missing a chance to mock Yang Mi's fear. Look at you, so cowardly with that mouse-like courage. How will you ever follow our brother Jang in the future? To Dr. Zhou, the chaos outside was merely a minor disturbance compared to the carnage Jiang Yi had caused in the community. As the crowd approached within range, Jiang Yi swiftly activated the villa's active noise cancellation feature, drowning out the sounds of the outside world. Then, without hesitation, he pressed the landmine activation button. A deafening roar echoed through the air as the explosion illuminated the area like daylight. Though Jiang Yi couldn't hear the screams outside, he could see the gruesome aftermath from his vantage point. Body parts and blood were scattered everywhere. Yang Mi, unaccustomed to such violence, broke out in a cold sweat and began vomiting violently. Even Dr. Zhu, who had seen her fair share of horrors, turned away in disgust. But Chang Yi felt no remorse. They had brought this upon themselves. Their bodies are blown to pieces. Let's run away, he pleaded. The village chief, shocked and overwhelmed by the devastation, collapsed to the ground. Is he a devil? We just wanted to rob his goods and wife. How could he kill hundreds of our Sioux family? He muttered, realizing the gravity of their actions. Unable to escape responsibility, he knelt in the snow, babbling incoherently. From the safety of the shelter, I observed the chaos unfolding outside, confident that the ice and snow mutant hadn't arrived. With no intention of keeping these hostile villagers alive, I equipped my compound bow and donned my cold weather gear. Commanding the shelter's AI system to open the front window, I prepared to strike. As the bulletproof glass window slowly lifted, I loaded three arrows onto the string. Thanks to over 10 days of rigorous training and the enhancement of my spatial ability, I had mastered the skill of shooting three arrows simultaneously. Standing in the darkness, I initiated a merciless hunt. With deadly precision, the arrows flew, instantly piercing the heads of three villagers. The modern compound bow, combined with my enhanced abilities, proved to be a lethal combination as life after life fell to my silent arrows. Amidst the panic, someone finally noticed and shouted a warning to the villagers. They hastily aimed their shotguns, but in the darkness and chaos, they couldn't discern my location. However, equipped with an infrared tactical scope, I had no trouble targeting them. As I continued to pick off the villagers one by one, Suong Ching felt a wave of regret washing over him. Remembering Chumley's earlier advice, he realized the extent of his arrogance and conceit. With a fierce slap to his own face, he acknowledged his failure to uphold the honor of the Su family. Contemplating his actions through the scope, I pondered whether to grant him his wish. Drawing my crossbow, I prepared to take him down. 
As a fierce snowstorm suddenly whipped up, forming a tornado that blocked the path to the shelter, I stashed away my bow and arrow, cursing the timing of the ice and snow mutants' intervention. Quickly switching to a sniper rifle, I knew arrows wouldn't cut it in this storm. Chumley, the mutant who knew the terrain better than anyone, heard the explosion and mustered his courage. He strained to clear the snow blocking the villagers' view, shouting for them to run while he held off the blizzard. Seeing his efforts, I abandoned shooting. Blindly firing would only waste precious bullets, and we were running low on ammo. Realizing Chumley couldn't keep up the blizzard for long, I geared up from our alternate space and bid farewell to my wives, urging them to wait for my return after a bath. Feeling a surge of determination, I armed myself and headed downstairs. Feeling secure in my preparations, I noticed Chumley still struggling outside. As the gunfire ceased, he likely thought his tactic had worked, but the roar of an engine shattered his relief. A snow SUV burst through the snow, and I engaged auto drive while unleashing indiscriminate fire, terrifying the villagers. Chumley's voice cut through the chaos, urging me to use the blizzard against the intruder. Scanning the crowd, I spotted the mutant, a chubby figure among the panicked masses. Even as everyone fled, he occasionally glanced back, signaling towards me. With a loud bang, a bullet whizzed past Chumley's ear, narrowly avoiding death. Terrified, Chumley broke into a cold sweat as a makeshift sled rushed over. Get on, I urged him. Sitting in the car, I pondered for a brief moment. This was the perfect opportunity to eliminate the opposing mutant. I had no reason to let him go. With this in mind, I revved up the engine once again and chased fiercely. As I pursued the mutant, thoughts raced through my mind. If I killed him, the other villagers would be like lambs to the slaughter. But Chumley still maintained the blizzard around them, especially around himself, tightly blocking it. However, it only managed to visually impair my attack. The range of the blizzard was limited, unable to protect everyone. With that realization, I simply turned my gun and started shooting the panicking villagers. Watching them fall one by one, Chumley was in immense pain but powerless to save everyone while protecting himself. I observed the scene with a sinister smile, curious to see whether he valued his own life or his villagers more. In my relentless pursuit, the villagers' dog sled stood no chance against my luxury snow SUV, especially since they were dragging the bodies of their kin to bury them properly, which slowed them down considerably. It was then that Chumley realized the problem and urgently told the villagers to discard the bodies. Reluctantly, they obeyed. Proper burial meant everything to them, but in this dire situation, they had no choice. The body slowed down my chase a bit but it wasn't a huge deal. The auto drive's obstacle avoidance was solid, just slightly messing with my aim. Still, I managed to hit my targets almost every time. Plus, the military sniper rifle, boosted by my abilities, packed a serious punch, easily taking out two heads with one shot. As I watched the villagers fall, Chumley was clearly in agony. Everyone looked to him for answers, hoping he'd come up with something. In a moment of near desperation, he had a stroke of genius. Opening his right hand, a blue light beamed from his eyes and palm. Suddenly, a crack appeared in the ice right in front of my path. With Chumley's continued effort, the crack widened, forcing me to pause my pursuit. Leaning out of the car window, I saw the crack stretch for dozens of meters, effectively blocking my way. Standing on the car roof, I couldn't help but shiver, realizing the mutant's power to crack such thick ice. Thankfully, his ability wasn't strong enough to completely break it open, or I might have ended up in the river with my car. I fired off a few more shots randomly, taking out a few more villagers until the crowd disappeared from my scope. Letting out a deep sigh, I realized that fighting him on ice in the future wasn't an option. An ability to control ice and snow in this ice age was beyond imagination. I got back to the shelter and found most of the traps wrecked, needing fixing. But it wasn't too bad since we took out a bunch of invaders. Yang Mi was still recovering from the horror, feeling queasy from the mess. Dr. Joe asked if I got rid of that sneaky mutant on the couch. I shrugged, and said he slipped away his powers making him tricky to catch. Zhang Yi wondered if we were being too harsh, considering killing is a crime. I just patted Yi's cheek, playing it cool. Back home and feeling a bit hungry, I asked Dr. Zhu to whip up some grub, specifically pig brain, duck gizzards, and large intestines. Yang Mi, still shook from the gore, started puking again. I teased her about her weak stomach and offered some nutritious food to boost her up. After the chaotic return to our village, everyone was terrified. We expected our heroes to come back loaded with spoils, but instead, it was a disheveled retreat with nearly half the people missing. Despair echoed everywhere, with cries for missing husbands and sons. Survivors and the bereaved alike were drowning in grief. I stood in the snowstorm, feeling lost. Then, my cousin urgently grabbed my arm, shouting, Quick, check on third grandpa. He looks like he can't hold on. He wants to see you. Su Dong Shu, my third grandpa, was in bad shape. My heart skipped a beat, and I dashed towards my house.
At Su Dong Shu's door, a crowd had gathered. Their eyes held a mix of emotions. While some survivors knew I had saved them, others didn't share the sentiment. Their faces showed blame and disgust. One woman, wiping her tears bitterly, said, Of all the Su family, only you are lucky, possessing extraordinary powers. But why didn't you go at the start? You caused my son's death. Some even openly cursed me, demanding their loved one's lives back. I helplessly replied in a low voice, I didn't ask them to go. They didn't listen to my advice and insisted on going. But my response only fueled their anger. They accused me of cowardice, saying, if you had used your special abilities from the beginning, we wouldn't have been bombed to death. I was furious, but I was used to being timid in the village. I didn't dare to retort in front of the family elders. Then, a scholarly elder came out of the house and said, let's say a few words less. This isn't Chumley's fault. Come in, the elder is calling for you. Inside, Su Dong Shu lay on the bed, barely clinging to life. Seeing me arrive, he spoke with a face full of guilt. It's all my fault. If I had listened to your advice, so many of our Sioux family members wouldn't have died. I'm feeling really ill now. It's hitting me that our village managed to pull through the snow disaster all because of your skills. Su Dong Shu had a realization, but it came too late. He gripped Chum Li's hand and confessed, I've already talked to the rest of the family. This whole operation was on me. Let them blame this old man. He knew people were talking about Chum Li in the village, but he urged him not to hold it against them. We can't afford to fight within the Sioux family. We can't break our lineage, he pleaded, tears streaming down his face. Before I go, I just have one favor to ask. Take care of the Su family. With tears in his eyes, Chumli nodded in agreement. After Su Dong Shu passed away, Chumli quickly alerted the others waiting outside. Despite the family's grief, Chumli felt overlooked and quietly left the house. As he walked, he felt a strange mix of emotions. He knew if Zangi really came to attack, they'd have to flee. He had once thought he was special, only to realize he was just a pawn. As I sadly made my way home, I spotted a young woman waiting at my doorstep. Seeing me, she hurried over and asked, Are you Brother Chumley? My cheeks flushed, and I stuttered out, Why yes, that's me. Who are you? The girl's eyes sparkled with gratitude as she replied, I'm Sue Lily. I came to thank you for saving my father. He told me you risked your life to rescue him today. I didn't know how to respond, so I awkwardly scratched the back of my head and muttered, It's nothing. It's what I should do. In that moment, it dawned on me, I wasn't just a nobody. I was a hero to the village. Lily, looking down shyly, continued, My father is still injured and couldn't come himself. He asked me to thank you in person but we didn't have anything to bring as a gift so I came empty-handed. I waved my hands nervously saying, Don't be so formal. We're all part of the same family. I'll definitely help if I can. After a brief exchange, Lily turned and disappeared into the snow. Even then, my heart raced uncontrollably. I realized I had fallen deeply in love with Lily, even thinking about names for our future children. It was a stark betrayal of my vow to never fall for a three-dimensional woman. With determination, I clenched my fist, resolving to protect the Sioux family and provide a stable environment for Lily and our future child. Realizing he was merely cannon fodder back home, Chumley had to devise a strategy. Two encounters with Zhang Yi had left him acutely aware of the demon's terrifying nature. However, he had promised third grandpa to protect the village, and now, with love in his life, he couldn't let that demon ruin his happiness. But the fear lingered. Would Zhang Yi Yi come in a fit of rage to annihilate the village? How should he handle this? A direct confrontation would surely lead to instant defeat. After much pondering, he concluded there was only one way to definitively resolve this situation. Negotiation. Excited by this risky idea, he was prepared to risk it all for the Su family and his beloved Lily. He hurriedly began searching for Zhang Yi's contact information on his computer, fantasizing that Lily must like him, as he had saved her father's life. According to TV drama plots, she must have a secret crush on him. The next morning, I cautiously stepped out, fixing the damage traps. I didn't think the Su family would dare another attack, but I still prepared for a potential second wave of enemies. Ordinary people weren't much of a threat to my shelter, but I had to be wary of awakened mutants. Thinking about the ice and snow mutant, I still harbored a bit of admiration for him. Our styles were somewhat similar, both very cautious about our lives. However, since I couldn't use him for my own purposes, I had to eliminate him beforehand. Dr. Joe had been wholeheartedly devoted to me for a long time, and Yang Mi, after the Sioux family town battle, lost her hope for the apocalypse's end. She used to believe the snow disaster was temporary, and the world would return to its former state, where she would be a dazzling star again. However, witnessing the brutal deaths of over a hundred people shook her belief. She chose to rely on me, not superficially, but genuinely wanting to be close. Just then, a phone call suddenly came in, startling me. Instantly I thought of Lua, and how my biggest secret had been exposed. Who could be contacting me now? But this time, I was much more composed as I answered the phone. Before I could speak, an excited voice came through. Hello Zhang Yi, this is Chumley from Sioux Family Town. Do you have a moment? I have something to discuss with you. 
Hearing it was someone from Sue Family Town, I instantly became alert. After yesterday's attack, I had no good feelings towards their village and was planning when to annihilate them. Chumley continued, I was wondering if we could reconcile and avoid troubling each other I in laughed. the future. I never troubled you. It was always you who provoked me. What? Now you realize you can't beat me and want to make peace? You're quite optimistic. On the other end of the phone, Chumley immediately became nervous. He was already very fearful in his heart. After two encounters, he had come to view the other party as a powerful and deadly figure. He then spoke in a trembling and submissive voice, I called you this time to apologize. All this is our village's fault. Could you please spare our simple villagers? Considering we haven't caused you any harm and have suffered heavy losses ourselves, you can set any conditions. I found the other party's overly respectful tone strange, and wondered why they sent such a weakling for negotiations. It sounded like a rookie just entering society. I then asked loudly, first, why yourself? Do you even have the right to represent Sioux Family Town? Chumley then revealed his identity. Actually, I am the mutant who has clashed with you twice. Hearing this, I immediately became serious. So, it's you. Yes, it's me. Do you think I'm qualified now? I thought, if it's him, he indeed has the right to negotiate, being the only person I'm wary of. My tone instantly became more amicable. You just said that as long as I agree to reconcile, you can fulfill any of my requests, right? Sensing a chance, Chumley responded with a silly smile. As long as our village can do it, we will try our best to satisfy you after this battle. Chumley was almost certain that I must be holding a large amount of supplies from the Walmart warehouse. He figured the village's offerings wouldn't interest me. I also sensed that this chubby guy was not stupid. His ice and snow abilities were a powerful weapon in this frozen apocalypse. If I could recruit him, he would be very useful. I then said seriously, I only want one thing from you, and that's you Chumley. Startled, Chumley yelled in fear. I'm straight, don't be like this. I was speechless. Don't misunderstand, I just find your ice and snow abilities unique. If you're sincere about making peace, come to my shelter in person, I added with emphasis. Otherwise, if I'm in a bad mood one day, I might just wipe out your village. You should know that your abilities are completely ineffective against me. Destroying your village would be as easy as flipping my hand. Chumley, terrified, stood up from his chair, his whole body trembling. Don't be hasty. Wiping out our village wouldn't benefit you, right? Moreover, our village and your villa area are interdependent. If there's an external enemy in the future, we can help each other. I sneered in response, don't talk to me about enemies. Aren't you my biggest enemy right now? If you win, you rob me of my supplies and wife. If you lose, you come seeking peace. Your calculations are so loud, I can hear them from my house. If you want to make peace, show your sincerity. What do you mean by calling me? Are you just informing me? If you're serious about making peace, come to my shelter at 2.30 p.m. Only you, Chumley, need to come. From the conversation, I got a grasp of this chubby guy's character, probably a timid, weak and cowardly otaku, clearly not a shrewd and strong person. So, I directly forced him to make a choice. Whether you come or not is up to you. If you don't, I'll find time to come over and wipe out your village. Hearing this, Chumley was immediately terrified, losing all rhythm in the negotiation. The horror in his heart magnified, and the scene of yesterday's massacre resurfaced in his mind. He blurted out, tremblingly, Okay, okay, I'll go. After saying this, I hung up the phone directly, not giving Chumley a chance to back out. He was stunned and collapsed to the ground, his legs giving way. This is it. Going there is almost certain death. My pure love, my life of cheats, is it all going to end here? After hanging up, I also became serious, starting to plan the afternoon meeting. This guy's abilities indeed had limitless potential and could be a huge threat. But if he could become my subordinate, that would be a good choice. I decided to test him in the afternoon. After all, his abilities posed no threat to me. I would decide then whether to kill him or not. After my rest, I went to the balcony fully armed, waiting for this chubby guy with my sniper rifle. Soon a figure appeared in my scope, the portly figure I recognized from last night's tactical sight. My aim was already locked on his head the moment he entered my shooting range. I could blow his brains out, but before he had walked a few steps, the chubby guy slipped and fell, making me burst into laughter. Is this the powerful ice and snow mutant, the one with limitless potential? But I couldn't let my guard down and continued to watch him. Just as he got up, he fell again. It seemed he was really scared stiff. Seeing he posed no threat, I relaxed and prepared to meet this interesting mutant downstairs. Chumley called out, warning me that my house was surrounded by traps and I shouldn't approach. No need for you to come, I replied, and in the blink of an eye, I stood before him. Chumley's legs trembled at the sight of me. Are you Zangi? He stammered, surprised that the fearsome killer he imagined looked so ordinary. Summoning his courage, Chumley explained he'd come alone to show sincerity, and suggested we end the pointless battle. I couldn't help but laugh. You started the fight, and now you want peace? I teased. Chumley scratched his head awkwardly, agreeing that the blame lay with our village. 
When I asked what he could offer for forgiveness, Chumley eagerly offered anything except the lives of our Sioux family members. Though I lacked nothing and didn't desire anything from their village, I demanded the initiator of the attack be handed over, insisting they must pay with their life. To my surprise, Chumley revealed it was their village chief who initiated the attack and was already terrified by me. Stunned, I couldn't help but wonder if any of the hundred people I killed the day before were his relatives. Chumley explained his own tragic story, losing his parents in a snowstorm and being looked down upon by his relatives. Surprisingly, he didn't hold a grudge against me for their deaths or the deaths of other Sioux family members, as he felt disconnected from them. On the flip side, I gotta hand it to you. The way you chased us in your car last night? Pretty slick. After hearing that, I figured I'd give this chubby guy a chance. I'm cool with making peace, but your village? Not my thing. Those villagers don't faze me, but you Chumley, you're kinda interesting. So, for your sake, I'll spare your village. Chumley got super hyped, rushing over to hug me. Being acknowledged by someone like me was a big deal for him. I had to wave my hands to calm him down. Hold up buddy, I've got conditions. From now on, you follow my lead, got it? Chumley looked terrified. What if I wanted something more than just his loyalty? I was speechless at his reaction. So, I pulled out my ace card, a limited edition figurine from my stash. Here, take this. Working for me won't leave you shortchanged. Chumley's eyes lit up. A rare figurine like that was hard to resist for an old otaku like him. I've got plenty more where that came from. Stick with me, and you'll have all the limited edition goodies you could want. Chumley happily hugged the figurine, nodding along. Okay, okay, whatever you want. And just like that, Chumley became my right-hand man. I had a soft spot for the guy. His straightforward, no-nonsense attitude was refreshing. Plus, his ice and snow abilities were top-notch in this Ice Age apocalypse. The potential there? Sky high. Since you're here, help me out with something, I said to Chumley, who perked up at the chance to prove himself. It felt good to have someone who appreciated my skills. So, I whipped out a snow SUV for my stash, leaving Chumley stunned. In his excitement, he started showering me with compliments. Time doesn't matter when space is king. Brother Zen's abilities are unbeatable worldwide. His words got me thinking. When I was on death's doorstep, I somehow went back in time a month. Could it be that my spatial abilities are tied to some undiscovered time travel ability? After driving for a bit, we pulled up in front of a big building that used to be a gas station. This shelter needed a lot more energy than our usual safe house, so I made sure to stock up beforehand. Once we found the spot, I told Chumley to clear away all the snow. He was eager to show off, so he put all his strength into it. With a loud bang, the thick snow cracked open, and then it started shaking like crazy. Huge chunks of ice and snow flew up and were tossed to the sides. At first, Chumley seemed fine but then he started to struggle. I watched him closely from behind, even though he's proven himself as my capable sidekick, I still wanted to see what he could do. It's always smart to be cautious. Eventually, we cleared out the buried gas station, and Chumley, gasping for air, collapsed on the ground. Inside, I was secretly thrilled because with Chumley's help, gathering resources in the future would be a piece of cake. I gave him a chocolate bar, and his eyes lit up as he tore open the wrapper and started munching on it eagerly. Meanwhile, I slipped into the freshly cleared snow pit, planning to grab all the stored oil. As I worked, Chumley started flattering me again, saying how amazing I am. I felt a bit embarrassed because, let's be real, Chumley did most of the heavy lifting. I just put the oil cans into the alternate space. I pulled Chumley up and asked if he'd ever used his abilities to dig up resources before. He said he had, but in this freezing weather, we couldn't go far. Plus, our dogs weren't purebred Siberian huskies, so we could only dig up stuff nearby. But that was enough for us. There was no need to risk our lives going further out. I gazed at Chumley like he was a rare gem. With you by my side, no problem is too big I assured him. Pulling out a backpack, I handed it to him as a token of appreciation. His eyes welled up with tears as he accepted it gratefully. Brother Zhang Yi, just say the word, and I'm there for any task, he declared, his voice full of determination. As we drove back, I casually asked Chumley about his awakening process. To my surprise, his face turned crimson, and he hesitated before admitting a deeply personal story. After my parents passed away, I didn't see a reason to go on, he confessed. I even considered starving myself to death. I listened in shock as he revealed that he discovered his abilities during this dark time. I thought, why not enjoy myself one last time before I go? He recounted, his embarrassment evident. I indulged without restraint, almost losing consciousness in the process. But then, something changed within me. I couldn't help but feel a mix of amazement and discomfort at his revelation. Dropping him off by the river near his village, he asked if I could drive him across. Despite the weather and his physical condition, I agreed. Just a press of the gas pedal for you, I replied, realizing how much this simple act meant to him. But I stated that my car tends to skid on the river's surface, so I'm not taking any chances. Once I'm across the river, it's Chumley's territory. Even though he seems to have submitted to me, I know I still need to be careful. His control of the ice last night, trapping my car, left me wary. 
He didn't question my concerns and obediently unbuckled his seatbelt to exit the car. Before he left, I called out to him, making sure he understood the risks. Hearing his name called directly, Chumley felt a sense of closeness. I patted his shoulder and spoke earnestly about the dangers lurking in this apocalyptic world. It doesn't hurt to make them more cautious by instilling this idea in him. Any stranger appearing nearby would be seen as a potential enemy by him, adding an extra layer of protection to our shelter. Returning to the village, Chumli excitedly ran to report the good news to the current village chief, expecting praise from Suong Tang. However, he was met with a harsh scolding, which clearly doused his excitement. Puzzled, Chumli tried to explain that he acted to protect the village from an attack, especially since Zhang Yi is so strong. But Suong Tang sneered, blaming him for yesterday's cowardice that led to heavy losses, and even the death of Chumli's third grandpa. Chumli was at a loss for words, feeling disheartened. He had promised his third grandpa to protect Su family town but now it seemed impossible to fight against Zhang Yi. To his surprise, Suong Tang suddenly scolded him harshly, demanding that all actions be reported to him first. Chum Li felt reprimanded like a scolded cat, filled with self-doubt amidst his thoughts of being a hero. Su Dang Tang suddenly approached and solemnly patted Chum Li's shoulder. Hey kiddo, he said, I know you mean well, but you're still too young. Your actions caused a lot of trouble for the Su family this time. If I hadn't stood up for you in front of the clan, you'd probably be out of the village by now. Sticking around is your way to make up for it. So, from now on, you gotta follow my lead, got it? He really hammered home that last part. Chumli nodded fervently, promising to toe the line. With a satisfied nod, Sudang Tang watched Chumli walk away, thinking to himself, youngsters these days, always so full of themselves. They need to learn some respect for their elders. Then, he whipped out his phone and fired off messages to different branches of the clan taking all the credit for brokering peace with Zhang Yi. Those branches, once worried about Zhang Yi's threats, now sang Su Dang Tang's praises, even suggesting he should have been clan leader sooner to avoid the mess caused by the previous leader's mistakes. They hailed Su Dang Tang's wisdom and foresight, feeling relieved that his actions had prevented further bloodshed. Feeling quite pleased with himself, Su Dang Tang muttered, That lazy gamer kid thinks he can outsmart me? Huh, he's in for a surprise. Back at the shelter, I filled the two sisters in on what had transpired. I chuckled as Yang Mi clapped her hands in approval. This is really great. Now we don't have to worry about them attacking anymore, she exclaimed. However, Dr. Zhou, accustomed to such events, looked at Yang Mi with disdain. My brother Jiang didn't wipe them all out, which is already the greatest mercy he could show them. There's nothing to be afraid of, she stated matter-of-factly. But since you, the scaredy cat, think this way, I can understand. Otherwise, you wouldn't have nearly vomited twice yesterday. Frustrated, Yang Mi stamped her foot. That's not true. I just didn't want to see such a bloody scene again, she protested. But Dr. Zhou paid no attention, coming over to hug me and praising me enthusiastically. My brother Jiang is so powerful. Those small fries couldn't possibly threaten us. However, a hint of worry crept into my mind. Last time we went to the defense camp for weapons, we found that the people there had already evacuated in an orderly manner, taking a lot of heavy weapons with them. These well-trained organizations are the most troublesome, I explained. Yang Mi, not to be outdone, pressed herself against me with her most prominent feature. Don't always think of the worst. At least we've solved our current problem, which is worth celebrating, she said optimistically. With a nod, Dr. Joe headed over to the bar to get some drinks. If we're celebrating, we must have a few drinks to enjoy it properly, she declared. Meanwhile, cook some of her signature dishes, confident in her alcohol tolerance. I'm going to teach you both a lesson today, I said with a laugh. Just have a bit for the sake of it. My alcohol tolerance is quite average. Excited by the prospect, the two women agreed. No problem. We'll stop when it's enough, they assured. But in less than two hours, they lay unconscious on the sofa, having failed to keep up with their bravado. Watching them, I couldn't help but laugh out loud. I forgot to tell you before, I was a warehouse manager. I used to sell alcoholic beverages, I admitted, slightly tipsy. Approaching them, I got busy with Yang Mi, who was in my arms. She opened her sleepy eyes, surprised to find me on top of her. How can you do this? Sister Dr. Joe is right beside us, she whispered. Ignoring her protest, I continued with what I was doing for two or three minutes before satisfactorily falling asleep. A few days later, Chumley suddenly messaged me, asking to go on a mission because he found staying at home too boring. He even suggested forming a five-person superpower team with each member represented by a color, calling it the Rainbow Squad. He assigned us names, I'd be the king of no color, and he'd be the king of blue. I was speechless. But to keep him on my good side, I endured chatting with this guy, extracting some useful information along the way. Gradually, though, I found it unbearable. It seemed like Chumley didn't have a girlfriend and had way too much energy. I couldn't hold back anymore and just blurted out, are you bored out of your mind, fatso? Surprisingly, Chumley wasn't offended, he felt even closer to me, calling me his brother and sending emojis of approval. He even said, how did you know I was bored all day? You're like a god to me. 
I was speechless. These types of oticus are usually on the fringes of society, so when someone shows them even a bit of kindness, they cling to it. Despite my harsh words, Chumley saw it positively. Over time, I couldn't bring myself to scold him anymore, so I turned on the smart reply software. Now, whenever he sent a few messages, it would automatically reply with a simple O. Oh. Surprisingly, even with such brief responses, Chumley was as happy as a 300 pounds child during boring times. In the shelter, I always head to the control room to keep a close eye on everything, meticulously checking for any security risks. Yang Mi has been doing a great job managing the ecological botanical garden, so surviving here isn't much of a problem. But there's one thing that's been nagging at me, the cybersecurity issue. The supercomputer controls all the programs of the shelter, and without it, everything would grind to a halt. It's no surprise that Lu Funga could hack into my phone, but even the tech-savvy Chumley could find my number, highlighting some serious vulnerabilities in our network security. Meanwhile, Yang Mi and Zhou seem to be in the middle of an argument. Yang Mi, visibly worked up, turns to Zhou and insists, you have to help with this. You've known Zhang Yi longer, and he'll listen to you if you ask. Dr. Zhou looks helpless, saying, I know Zhang Yi too well. He's cautious and wouldn't risk any danger, especially since we all rely on him for our livelihoods. After a moment of contemplation, Yang Mi asserts, regardless, I have to try. All I have is this body of mine. Dr. Zhou looks at her disapprovingly and suggests she's planning to seduce him. Yang Mi weakly nods, saying, for my sister, I'll do anything. Just then, I, who have been eavesdropping at the door, enter the room and jokingly ask why they're not sleeping in the middle of the night. Yang Mi, trying to act calm, grabs my hand and says we're just discussing family matters. I press further, wanting to know more. Zhou shakes her head in panic, saying she lost contact with her family after the disaster and came to Heavenly Sea City alone. Yang Mi stammers out that it's her family in danger, and her sister contacted her yesterday, hoping I could find a way to save her. Upon hearing this, I chuckle. What can you two possibly do to save someone? Don't tell me you're expecting me to risk my life to save someone unrelated. I'm not exactly a saint, especially now that everyone knows what's going on. Yang Mi dropped the act and clung to me, begging for help. She might be my only surviving relative, and I can't just let her die. Plus, she's Yi's sister, which means she's also related to Dr. Zhou who joined in with pleading eyes. She's family, Dr. Joe insisted. If we don't save her, we'll regret it forever. I looked at them helplessly. You both know how risky it is out there. My supplies in this shelter are like gold. I can't just give them away. Sitting up straight, I made it clear, there's no way I'm taking such a big risk for a stranger, no matter how hard they try to persuade me. But the sisters panicked, clinging to my legs and promising to fulfill any request if I saved Yang Mi. Then Dr. Joe whispered something in my ear that caught me off guard ever thought about a threesome? My eyes widened in surprise. Could they be serious? The sisters looked at me with hopeful eyes, waiting for my response. Just as I was about to refuse, Yang Mi spoke up again. My sister, Yang Xin Xin, is physically disabled. It's a miracle she survived this long. She's desperate for help. My mind raced. Could this be the same Xin Xin, the genius hacker, they mentioned before? An 18-year-old genius hacker would be a dream come true for my cybersecurity issues. And if she's the sister of these two, her loyalty is guaranteed. With a newfound excitement, I took the hands of the two women and reassured them, don't worry. Since she's your sister, she's like my sister too. I, Zhang Yi, never shy away from a challenge or turn a blind eye to those in need. As my words reached their ears, the two sisters couldn't contain their joy. Dr. Zhou even had a starstruck expression, thinking, Zhang Yi must be in love with me for helping us. Yang Mi, too, was moved to tears, expressing her gratitude. Pride swelled within me as I gazed at them. Despite my cold exterior, I am truly caring and value those around me. The sisters' perception of me underwent a significant shift, blushing at their newfound realization. Dr. Zhou fell deeper in admiration, while Yang Mi was completely smitten, lost for words. Though sensible, she knelt before me, a gesture of respect. After a night of intense discussion, I agreed to rescue their sister, Yang Xin Xin. Of course, my primary motivation wasn't merely a seduction tactic. Cybersecurity posed a significant challenge for me, and rescuing this genius hacker could potentially solve all my problems. I urged the sisters to share details about Yang Xin Xin's situation. Yang Mi explained solemnly, Yang Xin Xin is trapped in Azure Sky Academy, a prestigious institution known for educating elite and genius individuals. Graduates from there often become influential figures in politics and business. Intrigued, I wondered how a paraplegic girl could survive in such harsh conditions. Yang Mi revealed that high-level aristocratic schools like Azure Sky have special food supply channels and ample food storage in their warehouses. Yang Xin Xin managed to hide in the cafeteria early on during the snow disaster, which saved her from starvation. I still have a lot of questions lingering in my mind. 
why did she wait until now to reach out to you? In a crisis, anyone would seek help from whoever they could. Why did it take her almost two months after the apocalypse started to think of contacting you, her sister? As soon as I brought this up, Yang Mi was just as stunned. I don't know why either. Let me call her right now, she said, her anxiety palpable. Yesterday, there were so many things I didn't get to ask. But after several unsuccessful attempts to reach her, Yang Mi remembered she had tried to contact her before, but couldn't get through. So, she didn't hold out much hope at this point. Dr. Zhou chimed in, half mocking, half serious, maybe Yang Xin Xin thought you were already dead, so she didn't take you seriously at all. I turned to Yang Mi and asked, how far is Azure Sky Academy from us? Seeing Yi's clueless expression, I pulled out my phone and opened the map. Nowadays, signals are weak, and satellite positioning is unreliable, so we can only rely on the map. I discovered that Azure Sky Academy is located in the West Mountain District, about 23 kilometers away in a straight line from the villa area. Being able to reach you by phone is already a miracle considering the current long-distance communication breakdown. But it's also possible she thought you were dead, so she never considered contacting you, her seemingly useless sister. Come with me to the control room, I suggested. Ordinary mobile phones can't transmit signals through the nebula chain, but the supercomputer in the control room might be able to. After dialing Yang Xin Xin's number, we were met with a harsh electronic noise, indicating extreme signal instability and strong interference. However, after a few tense seconds, the call successfully connected, and the two sisters immediately became excited. Yan Xin Xin, it's me, your sister. Quickly tell me your situation. Your sister will find a way to rescue you, Yang Mi urged. The voice on the other end was intermittent, and the noise was overwhelming. We only managed to hear her say she was at the school cafeteria and that she was in a very dangerous situation. I urgently asked what kind of danger you're in, but all I could hear were disjointed phrases amid chaotic electronic noise. Then, a terrifying, inhuman roar pierced through the chaos, a sound like something out of a nightmare. The call abruptly ended, leaving only a busy tone echoing in the control room. It was supposed to be a simple mission to retrieve someone from a school, but the call revealed something far more sinister, monsters at Azure Sky Academy. Yang Mi, sensing my hesitation, clung to me, pleading in a soft, coaxing voice not to go back on my promise to save her. I reassured her, saying I would keep my word. But the situation had become tricky. I needed to call on two mutant allies for help, Uncle Yu, who would lead the way, and Chumli, who could control ice and snow. With me lurking in the back for surprise attacks, the formation seemed perfect. Chumli was eager to start the mission, and Uncle Yu readily agreed to join. Though I suspected the eerie noise might come from a mutated person or creature, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread. Still, with three mutants on our side, I hoped it wouldn't be too difficult to handle. The next morning, the sisters had prepared a full table of delicious food, but our minds were focused on the mission ahead. I didn't pig out on food since eating too much of a mishmash can lead to tummy troubles. And I had to watch my drinking too, as overdoing it could mess with my mobility. But I still needed to fuel up enough to keep going. I had my alternate stash of grub all set for quick refueling. Plus, my weapons and gear were good to go. Just as I finished prepping, Chumley buzzed me up, needing a lift from by the river. He knew my place was booby-trapped and didn't want to risk it. He'd lost family to those traps before. I told him I'd be there in a flash. After hanging up, I turned to the two gals. For your safety, you'll have to chill in the basement for a bit, I said. Yang Mi was puzzled, asking why the basement when the house was so secure. Dr. Joe got it in a flash, pulling Yang Mi aside and telling her to just roll with it. Yang Mi caught on that this was serious business, especially since the rescue mission involved her sister. Worried it might be a setup, I locked them up tight, knowing they'd be safe until we got back. Yang Mi got the deal even if it wasn't the comfiest arrangement. But she was all in to save her sister, giving me a pep talk and some encouragement. I promised them we'd bring her sis back safe and sound if she was still kicking when we found her. Leaving the basement behind, I couldn't help but sigh inwardly. I didn't like being so paranoid all the time, especially with those closest to me. But in this world gone crazy, you can't afford to let your guard down, not even for a second. With this, the chapter concludes. Don't miss out on the next installment. Hit that subscribe button.